just so ecstatic when Oren uh, suggested that he would talk to us about burnout. Um, and, and so I really appreciate Oren taking the time to be here with us. And uh, Oren Lee, for those that aren't familiar, um, is uh, the head chaplain at Integris and um, the, the, for the hospital network Integris and just uh, it is a great resource in, in that area and, and is always willing to visit and talk with you. And um, uh, he shared with me one day, uh, it, it's become kind of a passion of his to um, pastor to the, the ministers occasionally and, and be their chaplain as well when they're uh, having times of need. And so it's wonderful to, to have a voice like his that you can turn to uh, that's not somebody from within your congregation or even necessarily from your denomination. Um, but it's just nice to have that supportive voice, which is so needed um, now and always for all of us. So and with all of that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Oren. Uh, and I make uh, Just a little bit about myself. Uh, for 29 years, I've worked for Integris Health started off as a staff chaplain here, and then have worked my way up through the, the, the system and where now I'm the system manager for all the Integris hospitals. <clears throat> and when it comes to burnout and understanding burnout, you know, uh, one thing I do realize that sometimes we uh, take on a lot for ourselves that really help, not helps, but propagates that sense of burnout. And so uh, as I've talked with Daniel, uh, and this is really disconcerting because I can't see myself or y'all, but I'll go ahead. Uh, as I talked to Daniel, we talked about the idea of burnout. And one of the concerns I had is, you know, we all hear about what we need to do to keep from burning out or what we need to do if we are burnt out. And I'm just remember visiting with my wife recently. She retired a couple of years ago from the state of Oklahoma. And she was telling the story of, of when they all were having a real tough time and they were burning out, that the state set up all you know, these, these groups where people could, could uh, come in and they gave them books to read and they, they would report back to their mentor about all this. And she says, the only problem with that is it just added more to my sense of burnout because I felt like now I can't even take care of myself because all this other stuff they've added on to me. And so what I don't want to do today is to talk about how do we uh, prevent burnout or some of the things that we do if we feel like we're burnt out, because I think you know, most people understand the steps that we need to take to keep all that from happening. And so, uh, uh, you know, what I would like to talk today is more for us to recognize some of the causes of burnout. And so I'm not going to be given the cure, but I'm going to be talking about the, the disease. And, you know, with healthcare, we do that now. When, uh, you know, I started, you had hospitals and then you have medical care. Now you have health care. And uh, I struggle with asthma. And you can tell a little bit of raspiness from my sinuses that triggers my asthma. But, uh, but I've struggled with asthma my whole life and on a lot of medicines. The Integris and their wisdom has set up a program for employees that if you have certain disease, and asthma is one of them, that they will pay for all of your medicines. And so some of the medicines are $60 and $70 a month, you know, two to three inhalers and then uh, oral medicine, and they pay for all of it. And the reason is they know that uh, if we uh, can keep me healthy and out of the hospital, that saves them a whole lot more money than if I came into the hospital with a bad asthma attack. And so taking that Met that kind of that metaphor is that with burnout, you know, I would like for us to think about really what are some of the causes of burnout so that we can acknowledge those and see those and maybe avoid uh, some of the uh, 
burn the things that cause burnout. So maybe a little prevention is the key that I'd like for us to look at. Again, ask questions. And uh, when we think of burnout, one of the concerns I had, will this be too heavy? You know, because it is kind of a heavy presentation. But uh, some of the things I want to share is I want to understand I'm not taking this too lightly either, but it's just for us to, to get a better glimpse of what burnout is. And so uh, I have three analogies or pictorial metaphors. You can never find the right word, but there are three things, to, uh, pictures I want to show that kind of describes what burnout can be like. And the first of those is the, the guy that, that spins the plates. And I remember seeing late night Johnny Carson and other late night shows and some of the talent shows. They'd have people that were plate spinners on and they would get busy and they'd start spinning one plate. And then they put a second, they put a third and all these extra plates. And they would go back and forth uh, trying to keep those plates spinning. And one would start slowing down, but get ready to fall. And he would hurry over there and get to keep it going. And, and the, mm -hmm. the key would be, if he'd ever let one drop, then they all would just come crashing down. And that's so often how often I think we feel as ministers that often we're just trying to keep those plates spinning. And we're doing all we can do is just to keep this one going. And there's this one problem. We rush over there and keep that problem going, spinning, so it doesn't fall apart. And then we come back and take care of this one. And our biggest fears, we keep all these plates spinning is eventually one of them is going to fall. And if we take our mind off of that one that's falling, then they all come falling down. And so I mentioned here, you know, often we are like that plate spinner with our home responsibilities, our church responsibilities, our family responsibilities, that uh, often we just keep all these plates trying to keep them spinning. And the biggest fear is they'll, they'll have that cascading if, one falls. But the problem is you eventually you can't keep that up because eventually you're going to tire and they all will fall and come crashing to the ground. And so that's one of the descriptions I think of what burnout is like. Another one is Stretch Armstrong. So in the mid 70s, they came out with this uh, new toy called Stretch Armstrong and all the little boys would get that. I was, I was already out of high school when that came out, but all these kids would get these and they would play with them and they would stretch them. But they, they, one thing, there was a flaw in that you stretched it too far that they would burst and they would leak their gel and it would get on everything and it would stain things and the toy was useless. And that's kind of another metaphor, I think, for us when we think about our, uh, burnout, the point we get to where we just feel stretched every way possible and we're stretched too far. And before long, there'll be a leak and that will leak some of our, our, our inner gel, our emotions and our feelings, and they get on everything and it hurts everything. And then we feel like we're just useless because we've been stretched too far and we begin to burst. The third metaphor I want to use is that picture of the, the volcano and putting a cork in the volcano. And so no matter how much we put a cork in a volcano, eventually it's going to build up enough pressure, it's going to explode. And when it does it erupt, it's going to spew, the volcano spews its ashes everywhere. And you have the lava that comes out and it burns people and destroys things in its path. And then people all around are affected with the ash as the ash comes upon everything. That's symbolic, I think, often of the hurt that we face as clergy, as we deal with the hurt, the pain, the anger, the disenfranchisement, the people betraying us, that we try to keep it all under control. Like we're trying to cork that volcano and the problem is, at the most inopportune times, our, we erupt emotionally and spew 
things unintentionally out that, that impacts a lot of people. And the problem is once the ashes are out, you can't put them back. And once the love is hurting and destroying, we can't put it back. So those are three metaphors I wanted to use today when we think about uh, burnout. And you probably have a lot of metaphors yourself like that, those pictorial metaphors. And, and you know, we, I can joke or take this a little lightly, but burnout is so realistic. And clergy and those in the helping professions are off, over, often overwhelmed by the magnitude of their responsibilities. So often in churches, we're expected to be all, to do all, to be things, all things to all people, and that leads to burnout. Those of us who are in the ministry often have that sense of call to come into the ministry or the helping profession. Now, uh, Daniel didn't pass, and I, I forgot to tell you, I'm endorsed, I'm a Baptist, uh, so I'm a Tennis Southern Baptist Church. People ask me what type of Baptist I am. I, as one guy says, I'm a recovering Baptist. Uh, but I have my endorsements with a more of a moderate Baptist convention, the Baptist General Convention of Texas. But, uh, uh, but we as Baptists, and, I, and most of our denominations, we carry that sense of a calling. And I remember as a 12-year-old in my back room just playing away and having that experience with God where God literally spoke to me and called me into the ministry. And some people their calling is that that clear and concise. But we all have that sense of calling, whether it's just that sense of responsibility, that sense of that really experience between you and God, but we all have that sense of calling. And that calling is to care for those people who are hurting, for those people who are sick, to care for those people who are alienated to care for the, the vulnerable. And, uh, and we feel that we have that calling, uh, but yet that sense of calling makes, can have a negative impact on us, our families, and on our health. But our calling dictates and drives us to do so often what things were, we feel called to do. And so today, as we look at a calling, we are serving. So what are some of the things that lead to burnout? And today, as we have time, and I'm sure like I normally do, I'll spend a lot of time on the first two or three and then rest of the last. But uh, the things that we want to look at is unrealistic expectations. Troublesome people. Some of the identities that we take upon ourselves that can lead to burnout our struggle with boundaries and the church's struggle with boundaries, sense of isolation and a sense of conflict. And I know there are many more, but I want to focus on these today. And the first though, thing is unrealistic expectations. And in those, we look at the external expectations. At times, and we all can say, and I can imagine all can tell stories of the, our experience in church, that had unrealistic expectations of us. And so being a Baptist, I look in our Baptist uh, news journal, it comes out twice a month. And you know, always like to look at you know, their advertisements for a pastor. And so this is a real one. This is not made up. It's a real one I saw a couple of years ago. And it was a first Baptist church in whatever town it was in. It had an average attendance of four to 500 is seeking a senior pastor who is an experienced leader with a passion for discipleship and to serve with the love of Christ in our growing community and beyond. Candidates are responsible for functioning, leadership, vision of the church, as well as for the spiritual instructions and strategic leadership of the congregation staff and ministries of the church. Being a Baptist, it has to be a he in most Baptist churches. So they put, he must proclaim the gospel, be doctrinally sound, engaged in pastoral and community outreach, and provide leadership in all areas of the church. Send your resumes to so-and-so. Oh, look at That's exhausting. That's tiring. And, you know, I'm very happy with my job here. But if I was looking for a church, I would run the other way because their expectations were just so unrealistic 
of what their pastor can be. But how are change churches often realistic? One way they're unrealistic is over finances. You know, uh, I probably should have put this on the top, but, you know, there's a joke in Baptist, and there might be the same joke in Disciples and other churches that sort of have the autonomy of the local congregation, is that our goal is to keep the, the pastor humble and poor. We want a pastor who's humble and poor. God will keep him humble, and we'll keep him poor. And, you know, that's kind of a joke, but that's so true. You know, churches often want to avoid any type of conversation about money. I remember when I was fresh out of the seminary and was here, moved back to Oklahoma City and was looking for a church. And early on in my look, I had a contact with the church. And I knew that there's no way I was going to go to that church, but, but I was talking to them. And first of all, they said, you know, we want a pastor who only preaches out of the King James Bible. We don't want any other Bible. We want the King James. Well, I don't use King James, so I knew that wouldn't work well. But we, we began, I began to inquire, I said, well, tell me about what type of salary do you pay? And they said, well, we're not going to talk about salary because if you, God calls you, you'll come no matter what we pay. And there is that sense among, you know, in the Baptist churches, that's kind of the sense of law and carry is that, that if you feel called, then you come and God will take care of you. And it's kind of that hidden thing is, well, we might not, but God will. But, you know, finances, you know, it's unrealistic. If what we pay our pastors are unrealistic. And I probably will have this later in the presentation. But, you know, some of the research is, I saw this recently, just a few weeks ago, and I wish I'd kept it. But it, it was showing the salaries of all professionals. Those that had bachelor's, master's degree professional levels. And the bottom two in that salary structure was clergy and teachers. And so there's that unrealistic expectation of finances. And some churches have unrealistic expectations. We get a new pastor that our finances will grow. And if he's doing what or she should do what they should be doing, then we'll grow. And our finances will be there. But often they use finances as that, that uh, tool over you to hold over your head. Some churches expect you to bat 100% on each sermon. And that, that if you have a bad week and it's not 100%, then they kind of look down upon that. They expect you to be 100% on every sermon every time. But that's unrealistic. Churches often expect us to be prophetic, to speak for God, but don't step on anybody's toes. Don't make anybody uncomfortable. But we want a pastor who will speak for God. And that puts us in a bind because we can't really speak from God unless we're stepping on toes or making people uncomfortable. You know, for me, I, I don't pastor a church now. I just attend a local church. I uh, have been by on occasion working here in the hospital, but now I don't. But I, I go to a church and I listen to my pastor. And I want, I want them to make me uncomfortable. I want them to challenge me to think maybe a little bit differently. But yet so often we want pastors to preach, but not make us feel uncomfortable. We often, churches often expect us as clergy to be responsible for church growth. And that same Baptist messenger, uh, the Baptist monthly, twice a month magazine now, that they, the back, they list all the church open, well, not all of them, but you can advertise for your church uh, in that. And so there's usually each time 20 or 30 or 40 churches that are looking for a pastor or associate. And so many of them will put in that, that we won't, uh, who can help our church grow. We're a church, but we want to grow. We want a pastor that will help us to grow. What that tells me is they want a pastor who will make the church grow, but we don't want to do what's necessary to help the church grow. 
Then I put here the big lie. We're not talking about politics. That's the big lie that churches often don't sell us is we want our church to grow. But it's a lie because they don't want their church to grow. That's a good thing to say, a good thing to tell, tell the pastor, but they don't want churches often to grow. They want to keep it the way it is. But when a church grows, it always changes. I bought into that big lie about 30 years ago. Moved from West Texas here to pastor a church. And there, it was in a, uh, a smaller community, but in a growing part south of Norman, uh, uh, the Slaughterville community. And they're building houses in that area. And the, there's a new church and it's all the potential in the world. And we want a pastor who can help our church grow. We want to reach our community for Christ. We want to be an, a, a lighthouse to the community. And all these lies they tell you. And so I believed it. So I went there. And when I went there, they're averaging 40. 18 months later, we were, we were on a Sunday morning. We are running 120. And the church grew. And people that were in control, lost control. And there began to have this friction between me and the leaders of the church because I believed that they wanted the church to grow. So eventually we had a meeting with our director of missions and they told their side of the story. I told my side of the story and they, and the director of missions says, well, he's doing exactly what a young pastor would do to help a church grow. The one crotchety old deacon threw his papers down and said, that's the problem. He wants us to be a big city church and we just want to stay a small town church. See, they lied and I believe that lie. So often we're called and they want us to be responsible for church growth. And so we're responsible for this church to grow. If it's not growing, then it's your fault, Pastor. What do you need to do to help this church grow? And Or maybe we need to find another pastor who will help the church grow. Then the church grows and they complain because they don't want the church to grow. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my negativity here. But I think when they say we want the pastor to be responsible for church growth, it, it's the big lie. Also, I put here is that they're unrealistic about our day off. You know, most people in the financial field, they have two days off. Often in the pastorate, we'll give them maybe one day off. And, you know, that's Saturday, but the rest of the week, you got to be in church working and, and you approach them about another day off. And, well, why? Well, because I'm working on Sunday. Well, you're only preaching twice, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, our time off, they often causes some conflict with the congregation because they always want us to be there. They always want us to be available, and we don't have that time off. So the day off is unrealistic. The time work is unrealistic. Churches have an unrealistic view of the time that we spend. So I, I, I ran to this uh, recently, and it's from a couple of years ago, and it was a Baptist pastor. A Baptist pastor in Florida did a survey of his deacons, and there were, I think, like 20 deacons in his church. And he asked them, you know, I want you to list what you expect the pastor to do and how much time it would take for that task. And so they turn in all their work and he averaged each week, you know, it, what they think a weekly time for a pastor. And this is the average. And this is what he came up with. Well, the pastor needs to be at church and pray for 14 hours. We're going to give him 18 hours to prepare for in Baptist circles is three sermons you know, two, month, two on Sunday and one on Wednesday. And he needs to be out there reaching our community at least 10 hours a week. We need to be in the office counseling people at least 10 hours a week. He needs to go take care of the homebound and the sick and go to the hospital for 15 hours a week. He's got to take care of all the administration of the church, 18 hours. And be involved in your community because that's how you reach the community, by being involved. So five hours a week. Be involved in your denomination, five hours Go to church meetings on top of all the worship services, another five meetings, and then worship services four hours a week, and others just miscellaneous for 10 hours a week. And so he tallied all that up, and he ended up, they expect their pastor to be working 144 hours a week. And I thought, that is so unrealistic. 
Now that's 16 hours a day, seven days a week. And how many of us literally do spend almost 16 hours a day doing either the work or doing the work of the ministry? The church I told you back that I have, I have, I eventually resigned that church. But I remember trying to do all the things I needed to do, pastor the church, trying to reach the community and study and get ready for Sundays. And so I'd walk over from the church over to the parsonage and I, in the evenings I'd be studying. And one evening my wife was in another part of the house and I went to the kitchen to get a drink or something. And I heard her say something that broke my heart because she said, you know, when he's here, he's not here. He's got his nose in a book and in church work. And it broke my heart because when I was at home, I was working. And I wasn't spending time with my family because I was trying to get ready for church or addressing a need that's coming up. And so the, the expectations of time are unrealistic. And so we do know that churches have unrealistic expectations of us, which can lead to burnout. But some of the unrealistic expectations are internal that we have of ourselves. And so this from the cartoon Pogo, yep, son, we have met the enemy and he is us. Because at times we are our worst enemies when it comes to struggles and, and burnout. And what are some of those? Well, we have, you know, internal drives. Man, most of us, and, and I'm not sure, I, I think in your denomination, you all have to have your master's degree. But, you know, for to go get out of high school and to go to seminary, go to college, go, uh, to go to seminary, make a living, try to get through seminary. You have this eternal, internal drive that's really driven that you want to work hard. You want to do the right job. And, you know, it's not enough just to go to seminary and just learn the little you can. You want to do it as completely as you can. And I had a talk with a, and it was for Greek, a, a pr professor. And I was struggling with it. And he said, you know, you just have to get the point to accept less than perfect. And he said, you do your work, you turn your work, you will, grad, you will get a, a passing grade. And I had to learn to accept less than best. But I felt guilty because, you know, God called me. I need to give my best to God. And, and, and you know, they're supporting my ministry as I'm attending seminary. So I need to, to give my best. So we have that internal job. We're overachievers. You know, it's not adequate. It's not enough. We want to go way beyond. And we see what's good enough for the church. And we want to go even further and do all these new plans. And I remember I pastored three churches uh, over the years, and you know, I was always wanting to go beyond what was expected because I am, a, a, in a way, an overachiever. That we as pastors are visionaries. We see beyond just what's here. We see way beyond what, what, what's out there. We see not what is, but what can be. And so we're visionaries. We have ideal, idealized views of what our role is. That that I can do something. I can make these changes. I can be that that uh, catalyst that makes these changes in these churches. We have a sense of justice. You know, most of us who are pastors and who have sit, gone through seminary and learned at, from just life experience have that sense of justice. What is the right thing to do? And at times it can get us in trouble, and we can have that martyr complex because we're seeing a sense of, uh, uh, seeking a sense of justice. We had a, a, a clinical ethicist at our hospital at, uh, you know, several years ago, probably 10 years ago now, and he was new out of, out of school. He was not Christian in any sense. He was a clinical ethicist, but he was having to speak before our board about a controversial issue. And our board, even though Baptist Hospital is not owned by the Baptist, 60% of the board has to be Baptist. And it's a self-propagating board. The convention doesn't appoint them. But it, we had a more conservative board at that time. And he was talking about an issue dealing with fertility. And he spoke up about some issues related to that. And uh, they just raked him over the coal. 
He says, well, I'm not a biblical ethicist. I'm a clinical ethicist. And he thought he was going to lose his job. And, and he, he had no profession of being Christian at all. But I in, got to know him real well. I said, you know, you're being prophetic. You know, you're speaking prophetically to our, our organization. And that's what our ethicists should do. And he felt, yeah, I am. And then I, I wasn't very pastoral as I said, and you know what they did to the prophets? No, I said, they stoned them. <laughs> so, but, you know, he had that sense of justice. He wants to stand up what's right. And we as clergy often have that sense of justice, more so than a lot of our congregations. And we want to speak on an issue, a just issue of justice. At times it can be pretty uh, conflictual. And so uh, we can have that bar of complex. You know, as clergy, often we're pleasers. We want to please people and we want to make people happy. And, you know, I grew up say, learning that if we just say all the right things and do all the right things, that we'll be a great pastor. And I learned I can't please everybody. And the more I tried it, the more trouble I got myself into. But personally, we, most of us are pleasers. We don't want conflict, so we'll try to, to avoid it. We're peacemakers, so we'll try to, to make peace with, with between us and maybe some of our elders or deacons or, or between a couple of group of people. And we want to serve as peacemakers, but that also instigates a lot of burnout. And we're perfectionists. And so I have this. As perfectionists, we got to hit the bullseye or we're a failure. And we have to, as clergy, need to learn that we can't get it perfect. We don't have to get it perfect. Sometimes we have to accept we're just well enough. And related to that, you know, when I was pastoring, I would spend week getting ready for the sermon, and then I would be finished by Friday, but then Sunday, Saturday, I would be thinking about trying to get it just, I want to be perfect. I had to learn to let go of that. Because Saturday was my time with my family. So uh, we have those uh, unrealistic expectations from the church, but from our own internal drive. And then we have burnout because of troublesome people. In every church, there'll be troublesome people. The you know, church is a magnet so often of, of, of difficult and troublesome people. We know John had that problem as he wrote here. And he talked, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Mm -hmm. Never satisfied with that. He will refuse to welcome other believers. He also stops those who do, who do so and puts them out of the church. So we see even in the, one of the first churches, they had their bullies. And when I mentioned bullies, you know, I think all of us probably can envision a picture of who a bully is in our church. And this is a, and I'll take a bit of time, I won't go into this, Barry, but he talks about, you know, bullies are dysfunctional, they victimize people, they abuse morally, and, uh, <clears throat> and they take advantage of openings in the church. And they have learned to be bullies within the church. But what are some other troublesome people? The needy. And I know there are people in, in each church, there are people that are just needy. And that's not to be a put down. Uh, and, and even though they're troublesome at times, that's not to say that's bad, but they're, they demand a lot of our time. And they come in, they ask for lots of attention because they're so needy. And uh, in and, and each of my churches, uh, took my first two churches that I was full-time at, that uh, I can identify people who are needy. And so much of my time was just trying to help them through their daily, daily issues that they're going through. Then you have the dominant. You know, those people who had the dominant personality. I know one 
person I can think of personally was a woman who was large and she used that largeness as kind of that domination that intimidation. And in each of our church, we have people that are dominant and they, they want to be in charge and they don't want you to be in charge. And not all pastors, but I'm pretty much an introvert. And so an extrovert can be very intimidating to me. And so maybe it's very dominant can be intimidating and, and hard to deal with. And then you have the openly hostile. They make no bones about it. They didn't want you to be here. They wanted their, their cousin's uh, uh, spouse to be the pastor, or they wanted the previous youth minister to be the pastor, and they're openly hostile against you. Or their last pastor treated them badly, and that, that, that they're, they're not even cordial around you. You just kind of sense the hostility. And, and, but they're members of the church, and we have to learn to deal with them. Then you have the passive aggressive. So when they're around you, it's all flour and sugar and honey. And soon they'll talk bad about you behind your back. And, uh, uh, and they're just that passive aggressive type things. Then you have the narcissistic. Those people who think it all revolves around them. And just to put a plug in next week, next Tuesday, when one of our monthly clergy programs, we're having a speaker, a seminary professor, uh, come talk about when narcissism uh, comes to church. And he's going to be about talking about narcissism in the church because they can be so challenging to deal with. And uh, and one thing he points out, you know, clergy, you know, we all have a little bit of narcissism in ourselves because who can stand up once or twice or three times a week before a group of people and say, I have a word from God for you. So, you know, we all have a little bit of narcissism, but those people that are strongly narcissistic can be hard to deal with. And the critiquers, so those that have a critique of everything you do, have a critique of every sermon you've had. And I have seen people like that, I've dealt with people like that, that you do a good job and they have something to say about everything that you do. And I've learned it. You know, you know, my, with that one church particularly, it was so difficult. You know, we would have our deacons, which were like the elders of the church, the deacons meeting, and it just got to the point, you just got so tired of them critiquing your sermons. Either they were too long or they were too short. Either you're too negative or you're too positive. And, of course, the one that always got me is that, you know, you preached out of Revelation on Sunday morning. Everybody knows Revelation is a Wednesday night Bible study and should never be preached out of Sunday morning. And so, you know, there's always the critiquers. They always have something negative to say about everything. And, uh, and they can be such a drain on you emotionally and physically. And one of our speakers uh, a couple of months ago did a great job. He was an elderly man that spoke at our monthly clergy program. But there was one lady that's a nurse that wrote a letter to me to send to him, talk critiquing on everything that was wrong, that, that he, his, the, gra the grammar he used, and what he could have said that was better. And so I chose to send it, not send it to him and destroy it. And uh, then I sent an email to the guy who set it up for him and said, I'm not going to send it to him. So when she said, did you forward that? I said, yeah, I forwarded it. But I just didn't afford it to the speaker. So, you know, that's that sense of critiquers, always critiquers. Then you got the gossipers that always sense to gossip about everything in the church. And I tried to put gossiper here and it said a correction. So it's the gossip, those who gossip. And I was really reluctant to talk and put this in here because the mentally ill are not troublesome people. I don't want to label them as troublemakers, but they can be a drain on us in the church. So the needy are often have a mental illness. And, and, and it, one of my church, the first church I pastor, we had a lady, didn't know what it was labeled, but she was uh, uh, bipolar. You know, one day she would call and just, oh, God, it's so great. And all the excitement, she was flying high and cut. The next day it was, oh, pastor, everything's so horrible and everything's so bad. And it 
if it was a drain, and you know, that was warned about it ahead of time. They didn't tell me who, but I knew who very quickly. But I just learned to love her and accept her. And, but it was emotionally draining. You know, you know, not every day, but several days a week, had to deal with those mood swings and then the compulsiveness of other people. And you got you got to do this just right. You know, you you changed our worship service and and you know this is how we do it. And so, you know, there's the mentally ill, and and now I want to be clear, I don't see them as troublemakers, but they do drain on us emotionally and spiritually. And so we've had troublemakers. And, and the third thing is our sense of identity. We looked a little bit about that earlier, our sense of calling. You know, our sense of calling is not what we do. Most of us, our sense of calling is who we are. It's our identity. It's our purpose. And, you know, the problem is we never leave that role as a pastor. You know, we go home at night and we still carry that role as the pastor with us. And uh, we go on vacations, we always do that role as pastor. And so that's a sense of our identity is our calling. And, but also that calling encompasses some identities that probably are not so helpful. And some of these are lighthearted, but there's that sense of, of truth about that. And the first of those is super pastor. You know, one identity we take care of us is that sense of a super pastor. I'm there to do, I'm the one who can take care of all the problems. And I put the quote from Mighty Mouse, men of that generation, here he comes to save the day. And, you know, and we often take that. There's a problem in the church. We're there to take care of that problems because I'm super pastor. The problem is that we're not super pastor. And it can cause us to fail. But we often take that identity. I'm the super pastor. I can do what, take care of whatever problems and take care of any issues of the church. I'm the, the do-all, fix-all for all people. Another identity we can take on that can cause burnout is that night and shining armor. That there's an issue, I will come and I will solve the problem. And so a quote here from the movie, The Three Amigos, Whenever there is an injustice, you will find us. Whenever there is a suffering, we'll be there. Wherever liberty is th threatened, we will, you will find the three amigos. And so we have that sense of that whenever we see an injustice or when there is something not going right, we'll be that shining armor coming to swoop up and take care of whatever problems there are. And that can lead to burnout when we always carry that mantra of the night and shining honor. Another one could be that I'm the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger with his faithful companion, Tonto, the daring and re, re, resourceful mask rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early Western states. And so there are some people that they see their goal is to come in and to be the Lone Ranger, to come straighten out the problems of the church and to, to, to take care of whatever issues there are. And I'm the Lone Ranger. I'm the one called to take care of all these problems and straighten them all out. But loneliness can be a big issue. And trying to fix it all can be a big issue. And I had to learn it is... I'm not God. I can't fix all the issues. And I can try, and it just bring, continues to propagate that sense of failure and burnout when I try to, to be that. And God clearly told me, and again, one of those times I was struggling, and I said, you're not God. I'm God. Mr. Know-it-all. Uh, I might back show my age, but Bullwinkle and Rocky the Flying Squirrel, and he would have that Mr. Know It All that have all the answers, all the questions. And we take this on, and actually, the church to the point kind of imposes upon that. We are to know all the answers, and we want to know the, all the answers. And I see that even in my ministry here at the hospital. And over the years, as all the nurses on the floors would get to know me, they would say, You know, Pastor. I was just thinking, there's a verse that says so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. What verse is that? And I am trained in the seminary, but I'm not a great 
I'm not actually a very good theologian. And so I struggle with all that. So I would say, you know, let me think about that and I'll get right back to you. And so I'd go downstairs and I'd go Google and find the answer. And then later I'd go up to her and say, well, I've been really thinking about it. I think this is the answer to your question. <laughs> but, you know, we have that sense that we got to have all the answers. And I see that in pastors a lot. And particularly when they come into the hospital and they're struggling with a bad situation going on and they don't have all the answers. They don't know why this is happening. And so often they'll revert to the one thing they know in their training, and that's their theology. And so they'll quote some theological premise or they'll quote some scriptures, which can be harmful at times. But the struggle is they feel they have to have an answer. And they don't think it's adequate to say, I don't know, because they feel that's inadequate. And actually, I think the church thinks that's inadequate at times. But I have learned through most of my ministry, I don't know the answer to that. Mr. Fix-It, there's a problem in the church, we'll fix it. And it's a problem we can take on ourselves too much. Uh, Dear Abby, and you know, you're that counselor, that listening ear. They come in and they'll talk to you and they'll share their their worries and and now you're carrying those burdens all upon you and and that can be draining. I learned a long time ago in my ministry, I am not a counselor, I'm not a therapist because it tires me out. And after I even do some brief counseling here in the hospital, somebody needs to come in and talk and it can be 30 minutes or it can be an hour and I am exhausted. But be, being that counselor, can, is a, lo- a load that we can have to carry at times. And Atlas, carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. I was trying to actually find a picture of Atlas carrying the church. Because so often that's how we feel. We got to carry the whole weight of the church on our shoulders. And if anything happens and the church fails, it's my fault. Or if anything bad happens in the church, it's my fault. And so we carry the weight of the well-being of that church on our shoulders. That's more than I can carry, more than I want to carry. The punching bag. And here I put from a long time, several years, my kids were young. Jumba Wamba is I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never going to keep me down. And we and as clergy often we carry that mantra. And so they pound us, knock us down, and we just pop back with a smile, ready for them to pound us again. And yet we we, we take a lot. And we take a lot smiling and we take a lot because we feel we need to do what's best for the church. I tell you what, getting being a t- punching bag is exhausting. It's tiring and it can lead to burnout. And so those are some roles that we take upon ourselves that we need not to because they lead to burnout. There are boundary struggles. Boundaries are there for our own well-being to, to protect us, and to keep us safe and healthy. And uh, my wife, she takes boundaries there as a constriction. She hates boundaries. I take boundaries as comfort. I know where I can go and how far I can go. But we often have boundary struggles. And I, I, as I teach classes here in the hospital, you know, we don't, we don't step over boundaries on purpose. We do it because we want to be helpful. Oh, there's the time boundaries. We already looked at that earlier. But, you know, we spend much more time than the 40 hours a week. The thing that was intriguing here, if you're a fourth of the time, you're going to work about half the time. If you're a half-time pastor, you're going to work about three-fourths of the time. If you're a three-fourths time, you're going to work full-time. And if you're full-time, you're going to work way more than full-time hours. And that's just kind of to see that that we have, we're not good at keeping boundaries and the church is not good and can imposing boundaries on us. Many clergy rarely allow themselves to say, ah, and this was, a, it's, it's stated a few years, but there's a study by Duke about that, uh, you know, of all the half-time and full-time pastors, over half of them went a full week without a day off because they worked at their full-time job. And then Saturday, they're work busy getting ready for church or they're doing stuff at church. And Sunday, they're at church. 
And so we're bad about having those boundaries. You know, we're always on call. You know, I call it that electronic leash. It was originally a pager, now it's a cell phone. You know, we never can get away because that cell phone's always there. And even when we're off, we're not off. And it can be draining. There are professional boundaries. Uh, you know, most clergy just want to help. They just want to give 100% to help with the church. And do we, we don't normally violate boundaries. All right, but, you know, one of the bad boundaries is we just can't say no most of the time. And if we say no, we feel guilty or the church that wants to, to make us feel guilty if we say no. But we need to learn to set some of those boundaries for our own well-being and our own health. We're always on call. 84% state that they're on call 24 hours a day. Probably most of us feel like if we get a call in the middle of the night, we're going to respond to it. And, oh, and they put second uh, self-care uh, secondly. And they allow people to violate our personal space. Uh, and those are boundaries. And I put it here. Most of us are actually have a sense of codependency. And I know time is almost up. I'm quickly just uh, now get to this. PowerPoint if you would like it. But here's some things, you know, can I define my sense of purpose apart from extreme sacrifices? Is it difficult to say no? Do I constantly worry about my church's opinion of me? Do I often keep quiet to avoid disagreements and keep the peace? And, uh, you know, now in the political climate, you know, you know, times we have to bite our tongues and keep quiet because I don't want to cause a stir in church. Have I observed myself to be approval speak seeker, especially the point of losing my own identity. Do I feel guilty? Do I get guilty feelings when I stand up for myself? And do I feel judged too harshly or do I judge myself too harshly? Do I feel responsible for others' actions and emotions? Do I have to make them feel healthy? Do I have to make them feel good? Uh, do I often cave into others' reactions? And do I overestimate uh, they have an overinflated sense of ability to control others' feelings and actions. So some good questions because, you know, we can have that sense of, uh, of not taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. And there are family boundaries and we're out of time, but, you know, our families are put on second burner. I told you the story about my family that uh, we live in glass houses. People always judge families. At my first church, this one lady took it on herself to tell me that my two-year-old daughter was, was not living right and that I needed to get control of her because she was abiding her son, even though her son was hitting my daughter. You know, they, they, she felt God's call to tell me how I should raise my families. Families really should be off limit. The financial boundaries, you know, I told you a little bit about that research, uh, but we're the lowest paid professions. And, uh, you know, most seminaries, you ain't leave with a lot of debt, but our churches pay too poorly to really for us to help get out of that. And there's, you know, on the bottom, there's, for clergy, there's no unemployment benefits. Churches don't pay into it. So if we leave, we're just out of luck. Um, and we'll just go ahead and get through that. The emotional boundaries, people can... Uh, feel they feel the right to to abuse us emotionally and to take advantage of us emotionally and so clergy deal with depression anxiety that second church of mine i would go to that church and i'd have anxiety attacks i literally getting ready to get up there to preach i would i would almost hyperventilate due to to anxiety attacks because I knew they were going to look down upon me. I knew they were going to judge me. And I knew they were going to complain about whatever I said. And so uh, those are some of the boundaries. In isolation, you know, we're often isolated. We, uh, often when we're mobile, we don't have the relationships. And we can't have relationships with church. And often we feel alone by ourselves. And we see Paul tell Timothy, can you come? I need help. I'm tired of being by myself. And the research studies here show how lonely pastors do feel. And then there's the conflict in the church. And so can we have, like Stephen Covey said, a win-win situation? Or in crucial conversations, 
you know, when we have a bad situation conflict, what do we really want? Do we want to win? Do we want to punish them? Or do we want a good outcome? But conflict in the church often contributes to that sense of dissatisfaction. And so, there, you know, you have your resources there and that can help through that. 